Hey everybody, welcome to the opening podcast on our unit on energetics. Here we're going to spend some time understanding metabolism and ultimately gaining um, some knowledge about uh, the processes of photosynthesis and cell respiration. But for this opening piece, we're going to really focus on what metabolism is and ultimately how living things gain the energy they need to survive. So a little chit chat about some energy flow. Metabolism, by definition, is when you talk about putting together all of the reactions that go on inside a cell. All of the building, again, synthetic reactions, and all of the decomposition, which are breakdown reactions, in a cell. And those total sum of all of those reactions is what equals metabolism on a chemical definition. The idea is to go from potential energy, which is stored energy, to kinetic, the energy of motion. And when you do that, though, that transfer of potential to kinetic energy ultimately creates friction, which ultimately releases heat. So for cells, potential energy is usually in the form of chemical energy. That's our stored energy focus, is we take in um, and consume, ultimately, food, which we measure in kilocalories, in order to have that stored energy um, and the bonds that hold atoms together. So to talk a little bit, we gotta mention a couple of laws of energetics first. And the first law of thermodynamics is that energy cannot be created or destroyed. This is something very, very important to understand as far as life in the biosphere. We have to constantly have energy input. We can't create it we would have no energy crisis if we could. Uh, It can only be transferred from one form to another. And in the case of us, we like to transfer it from this potential form to a kinetic form. It is a one-way flow. Um, As energy gets transferred from one form to another to another, it becomes less and less and less usable because entropy increases. And what entropy is is sort of the, the natural state of becoming unbalanced or becoming unstable or becoming chaotic, if you will. The second law of thermodynamics deals with that idea of entropy is that left unchecked, Um, systems just become disordered and they continually gain that entropy if we don't do anything. So where's our energy come from? Well, the primary energy source for our planet is very good. It is the sun. I knew you knew that. And that's where we get our energy input. That's what constantly is sending energy to our planet that we use. Without it, we'd be in trouble. Very directional is metabolism. The idea of collision energy, okay? So they're moving around, right? And if they ram into each other, a reaction's gonna happen, okay? So the idea is to hopefully increase the likelihood of them ramming. Many of the uh, uh, reactions of living things are reversible. Um, They can go, we can build up and we can break down. Um, So what can happen in one direction often can happen in the other, okay? And that reversibility helps lend itself towards the idea of chemical equilibrium. So the idea that I can take substrates or you know what we also have known them to be as reactants and we're going to call them substrates um, as well because that's going to play a role in the idea of enzyme function. I can take my reactants, I can create them into a product here, but I can also take my product and break it down into the substrates that build it up. Let me stress too that in this, enzymes are critical to cause these reactions to happen. So a couple of differences in some types of reactions. We have exergonic reactions. This means that there's a net loss in the usable bond energy. So energy is is given off. These are usually decomposition reactions. If I break, the idea is I snap a chemical bond, I'm gonna release energy. Okay, and so these would be something that as the reactions happen, you're going to get heat given off and they would feel actually really, really hot. Okay, another type is endergonic reactions, and this means that there's a net gain in usable bond energies. These are usually synthesis reactions, um, and usually energy is put in 
to these to make them happen. You have to actually add energy in in order for them to occur. Um, and that's usually the buildup of bigger molecules such as synthesis reactions. So endergonic, as I mentioned, that necessary energy input means that they're not super favorable because we need the help and by help usually that comes in the form of ATP and this is you know the idea of energy input because ATP um, provides us with our little, use, our little usable quantities of energy right? um, and we have to put that in again because it's constantly lost at the transfers so that we can increase that molecular potential energy we can have a constant stored cache for when our cells need it to do the work they need to do so let's get into a little bit about cellular work that's really what it comes down to right so atp this is a nucleotide it's it's a basically a modified adenine molecule it is a nucleic acid derivative um, it's called adenosine triphosphate and it has a really really high energy bond triphosphate tail okay and so what that means tri means three right so it has a this little I'm going to just say and phosphate as a reminder to us functional group PO4 um, I'm just going to use a little PI there so it has this little tail here and each one of these bonds is very very high energy and they are what we call our dollar bills they are our stored cash so what I'm going to ask you to do is remind me, say, hey, you need to tell us your story about and your analogy about what ATP is, okay? So keep this in the back of your mind. They are our $1 bills, and I'll tell you that story in class. So again, we have these really high energy bonds here, um, and what ATP is going to do when the cell needs the energy to do work, we're going to break off that phosphate bond, that phosphate group here, break it off, it will release a small amount of energy, just a little bit for the cell to do whatever it needs to do. Maybe like move something against the concentration gradient in active transport. So the PO4 um, group, that's what causes the energy transfer. So super important little functional group here that we're gonna spend some time talking about. Okay, and this is because not all of covalent bonds, and they are not all made equal, um, they're not as equally stable as others, so the slight instability of that phosphate group allows it to be broken nice and easily. Okay, so enzymes, again, there's going to be an enzyme that's going to cleave that last two PO4 groups, add them to other molecules, um, and that's what we call phosphorylation. That's a big process to a lot of metabolic reactions, and this provides majority of our source of energy that we use and this is going to be um, where we'll get into cellular respiration that is how we build up our cash our store of ATP okay and it is a cycle it's a renewable energy source if you will because again I can build and I can use and reuse molecules at will and you just need the energy input to put them in okay so let me show you a little bit about the ATP cycle so I have ATP, okay? I need a little bit of energy. So what do I do? I take energy I by busting off a phosphate group, okay? So this is then going to release this energy and I'm gonna be left with a random phosphate group over here. Now I have ADP. Well, if the cell needs more ATP, I'm going to need to input energy into the system to attach the phosphate group to the ADP may not be the same one so don't think that it could be any random phosphate group attach it to it so now I have an ATP molecule cell needs a little energy break it off I get ADP add it back on I get ATP and around and around and around she goes now the energy that is this is the energy from glucose this is the energy um, that's stored in a glucose molecule that we release during cell respiration to build up these babies right here so how ATP fits into the idea of metabolic pathways okay metabolic pathways are MPs um, these are enzyme mediated sequences every reaction well I should qualify that I'm sure there might be one but the majority the most 99.9% .9 of the reactions that happen in our body are enzyme mediated they won't work without enzymes enzymes are the catalysts of living things and by catalyst I mean they are there to speed up a chemical reaction 
So these pathways are either biosynthetic, or the enzyme-mediated pathways, I should say, are biosynthetic or biointegrative. Either they build stuff up or they break stuff down. So let's take a look at some of the types of these metabolic pathways. First, we have linear equations. Now, an example of this would be glycolysis. This is the first part of cell respiration. Pretty important um, little reaction here. So let me show you what a linear is. And this just shows a bunch of them. So a linear pathway is literally as it sounds. It's linear, okay? We go from A to B to C to D to E. And each one of these arrows represents the change. So here's the first part could be a couple of um, substrates or reactants. Here's the intermediate product. Here's another intermediate product. Each one of these arrows represents a reaction and each one of these are enzyme mediated. So an enzyme is going to be necessary and a different enzyme at that at each one of those different moments. Okay, so linear, boom, boom, boom. All right, another type is a branched. Um, and by that, um, there's another example. I'm going to use cell respiration here as pretty much the breakdown of the different types. The pyruvic acid oxidation would be a branched, meaning I take one thing, it's going to split um, into two different associated areas. So here we have a branched. I get this substrate, which I can take in this direction, or I can go off in this direction, just like a branch. So it makes sense why it's called that. Um, and then you get another series of reactions. Now one enzyme is going to be responsible for taking it that way. Another enzyme takes it that way. And again, um, at each of these, we have um, different enzymes that are going to be responsible for that. A third kind is a cyclic um, or cyclic metabolic pathway. Um, big example, Krebs cycle. Uh, this is uh, sort of the midpoint of cell respiration. And uh, this sets up the stage of making a bunch of coenzymes um, and cofactors necessary for ATP formation. Don't stress it, we'll be getting into it later. So here's your cyclic example, and just as sounds, I start with a particular substance, it's gonna get transferred again, enzyme, 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 and it goes from here to here, it swoops around, and then I swoops back around to F as this comes in and it's a constant swirly as it continues to go and go and go and go and go and it's a cycle you know I come all the way around and I'm back to where I started so again Krebs cycle great example as is Calvin Benson so ATP is going to be part of this process when energy is needed to allow the pathway to continue moving forward. Most often um, this will be again with active transport processes that are necessary to continue these metabolic pathways going forward. Um, so going from A to B to C may require movement against the gradient, in which case then I'm going to start using a little ATP to make sure that that happens. So don't forget about this ATP, ADP cycle. Go back to that slide if you need to look at it again, because in order to do all the things the cell needs to do for these metabolic pathways, we need to be using ATP all the time, and we need to replenish it all the time. So who's involved in all these metabolic pathways? Okay, I'm gonna say who, what is involved. First and foremost, we have all the substrates. These are all the reactants um, that are necessary, and you have your primary reactant, which is gonna be the very, very beginning of the pathway. You're gonna have your intermediates. These are, you know, that might be something like, if I have, what I mean by intermediate, you're gonna have A, let's say to B, to C, to D. Here's where I begin, there's my substrate. Here's my final product. B and C here are what I would refer to as my intermediates. Okay, and then finally you have D, the end product. Also involved are going to be your molecules necessary for the energy of the reaction, like ATP, especially if I'm going to build up a larger reaction. My ATP is going to be kind of important. You're going to also have uh, what we call different cofactors, um, and these are your proton and your electron acceptors. Um, often an example would be NAD plus or FADH. This is where that reduction and oxidation um, comes into play. Don't forget about those. Remember that from the summer reading? And of course, enzymes. These guys, I can't even stress the importance of enzymes in all of this. These are the proteins that are going to speed up those chemical reactions and allow them to happen at our temperature because we're just too chilly. 
And then again, cofactors, which are other, and you also hear them referred to as coenzymes. These coenzymes are um, basically enzyme helper outers. They just help the enzyme work a little bit better. And of course your transport proteins. If I'm gonna have to move something across membranes, which you do a ton of in cell respiration as you're moving them through the folds of the mitochondria, those are pretty involved in all of this as well. So when it comes down to it, metabolic pathways are, I mean, they're it. They are the it. They are responsible for everything that goes on in our systems and in all life sustaining systems. Um, I mean, I'm talking from bacteria to blue whales um, and everything in between. We need metabolic pathways for life to continue and these processes wouldn't happen without them. So they are that important. So. For now, we're gonna close out this first podcast um, of this unit. The next one's going to start talking about enzyme and enzyme function. So take it easy and uh, we'll catch you in class later on. Take care.